just thought I would uh, show the uh, third missionary journey once again, just to bring clarity um, in this matter. Because I think I was probably a little mixed up myself. So let me clarify that first and then we will proceed. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking at the map of the third missionary journey here. So just wanted to clarify because, um, yeah, I got a little confused. So from Antioch, we saw that um, Paul went through the upper regions. Okay, he went through the upper regions, and that that is why uh, you have these cities. Though the names of the cities are not mentioned, but you know, obviously, uh, he would have gone to people that he knows. To strengthen them because that was generally how he worked and then he came to Ephesus okay Ephesus we saw he spent a lot of time here uh, about two um, you know three months he spent ministering um, uh, in the synagogue and later on he took to the school of Tyrannus uh, you know and uh, like two years he taught in Ephesus and then you know we we will read later uh, in fact that the Macedonian region. So it says Macedonian region. So that is why the arrow from here, it points back to Macedonia. So, uh, you know, he knew people there. So that's the reason the map is like this with, with arrows going into those previous cities. He will visit those cities and again come back to a place called Miletus. Okay, so yes, this region, he did spend time in this region, but uh, include the Macedonian region as well. Okay, uh, so this is all inferred from what what has been given in the passages that follow. All right, and then yes, Miletus will be one one another place that uh, Paul will spend little more time there doing some uh, um, encouraging to the Ephesian believers, and then yes, this last part of the journey, which I said. That we will we will hear of these names and places till uh, Paul proceeds to Jerusalem. So just clarifying class, please do not get confused. Okay, up it just says upper regions, and that that is the reason the arrow is like this, the previous cities, and then after Ephesus it says Macedonian cities, and that is why the arrows are like this, going back to the cities that we have already read about. Then come back to Miletus and then, you know, close off the third missionary journey. So I'm just making it very, very clear. And I hope uh, that there, there is no doubt. And sorry if I caused any confusion. Okay. So that's about the third missionary journey. And uh, um, in Ephesus, we've seen the ministry that has taken place right now. What is going on? If I try to go verse by verse, you know, uh, it, it, it won't um, like... That doesn't seem to be a flow, so I'm just going to tell you like a story. So yeah, so what happened is um, there was a an opposition rising up against Paul, and they uh, took charge of some of his co-workers. They seized them, uh, and in the theater, right, all these chants are going on. So you can imagine that uh, Paul was upset okay and he he was he wanted to defend his people and he's being the passionate man that he is he wants to go into the theater and rescue them but the people of ephesus some of his friends officials they say please paul don't go otherwise you know they will seize you and other things can happen so they prevent him and during that time you have the leader okay the uh, alexander he kind of rises up but he can see that the is going crazy they're screaming you know diana of ephesus diana of ephesus because they wanted to preserve that status see if a city is known for a particular um, uh, speciality let's take for example if a city is known for um, uh, 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 um, a city center you will have the souvenirs we'll all have that city center Right? They'll be giving that out. Now, if you destroy the city center, what will happen? The identity of the city is gone. So the kind of impact that Paul had, his ministry, his team uh, had on the city of Ephesus was so tremendous that what marked the city, which is the worship of uh, goddess Diana, that itself was under threat now. And that is why people are going so crazy and they are screaming, Diana of Ephesus, like, we don't want this to change. 
okay we don't want the state but is there an ulterior motive yes there is the business of demetrius and his people they were getting big money out of making you know silver idols of the goddess diana um that was being affected now when this commotion happened in the city uh, alexander stood up and he's trying to calm the crowd down and say hey guys please listen to what i'm saying but they're not willing to listen but somehow right they calm the people down and then alexander kind of talks to them and he says that uh, uh, you know who who is the person who has a problem right now demetrius okay so demetrius was a businessman in the city he is the one who has a problem why can't he fight this legally and that is what alexander proposes and he says look the courts are open there are proconsuls in the courts let them just go and let them resolve the matter in a legal way what is all this chaos screaming gathering in the theaters and we also have to remember those days the way they created the theaters there you no know, it would uh, um, carry the sound in such a loud way so whatever was being spoken within the theater you know it would it would uh, be loud and clear to a great distance so and if so many people gather and they shout you know diana of ephesus it would be heard by you know all the people living in the in i mean uh, around that uh, around that place and uh, the worry that alexander had was you know those days if a um, if an authority could not control their people if the authority could not maintain peace in their region then the roman uh, officials would come and they would take away the authority okay so that was the fear of alexander if these people continue to create this commotion you know uh, the romans will come and they will uh, ask us to leave and you know they will take over the city of ephesus so very quickly we have to bring peace and calm in this city and with that intention he just tried to diffuse the matter and said look why are all of you gathering uh, together with demetrius he is the one who has a problem let him go and resolve it himself in the courts and that is that is the conclusion over here so you see how god is intervening in paul's situation um you know earlier it was some other leader uh, in the city of corinth who said if it's a legal matter bring it to me religious matter i'm sorry you know i don't have time to waste similarly you know alexander tries to uh, bring uh, bring this uproar down by saying that uh, let demetrius deal with his own issue and i'm just going to dismiss this assembly please uh, stop this confusion and chaos now after this happens we are moving on to acts chapter 20 and in acts chapter 20 you know it uh, um Paul is very very interested okay in going and ministering in the Macedonian region so uh, we see here that Paul he um, greets the believers in Ephesus and he moves on he departed to Macedonia earlier he sent two people right he asked some people to go he didn't go himself but he realizes that in this kind of an environment i don't think i can continue serving it's better for me to move to macedonia so god uh, he had prayed and he had already purposed in himself that he's going to go to macedonia so now he takes off to macedonia so he goes there he encourages the believers there uh, he comes to greece remember greece is where athens that city um, where he ministered was so he comes to greece he stays there for some time and uh, even now he is having opposition from the jews and they are plotting against him uh, and you know they are they are closely watching what paul is up to so he goes to athens he goes to beria and uh, you know he is accompanied we are told by um, aristarchus and secundus of the thessalonians okay so one interesting thing about this is you know aristarchus is apparently a name of somebody who is from a, a, a famous family okay and secundus is the name of a by the name you can understand that he is from a slave background because apparently when people had uh, workers uh, 
they would name them primus primus would be the first uh, slave and you know secondus would be the second slave so you see how uh, the gospel has changed and transformed people paul has companions and both of these people it is said in one breath aristarchus and secondus but you know one is rich and one has come from a very humble background but both are working together and that is the beauty of the gospel you know how how uh, people are transformed and people are joining together you know we talk about kingdom of god right this is the kingdom of god where everyone is equal in the sight of god everyone is the same in the kingdom of god so they are all laboring together they are all working together so you know we hear of um, other names as well a name called sopater of beria then gaius of derby then there is uh, timothy timothy is of lystra we know that then there are other names tychicus trophimus so paul was uh, one who never believed in you know just being alone just serving god alone he was a team worker and you have so many names here and we know in the epistles there are other names as well so <laughs> excuse me there were lots and lots of people who were serving along with paul and that is the idea we get so as he's going through these regions now we get a picture that the churches have grown disciples have now matured even into ministers and they are partnering together with paul okay uh, and um, you know they are going through the read paul is going through the regions he's encouraging people and uh, it is likely that he was also up to some collection of funds to provide for uh, you know the needy believers now uh, let's continue on so he touches those regions in macedonia he also goes to philippi okay and then suddenly the language changes in verse 6 we are told but we sailed away from philippi remember he had left luke in philippi so it is likely that after all this time luke also rejoins uh, paul and they start moving towards troas so they come to a place called troas and over there paul uh, ministers to the disciples it is said that every first day of the week these disciples would meet together uh, and hear god's word they would also break bread so looks like it's a practice you know first day of the week they will have communion and you know spend time it's something like sunday service uh, it that is going on and because paul has come here he wants to share everything which is on his heart so paul is aware that he has to make a journey to jerusalem and he has to quickly you know move towards the jerusalem so he did not have much time so what he does is on the first day of the week when this meeting is going on he decides to spend more time and talk to the disciples at troas okay and the meeting goes on you know we know of uh, um all night long worship all night long um you know prayer intercession uh i've heard of of things like that but all night long sermon uh that is somewhat unusual okay not that it doesn't happen but we don't see that very frequently and because paul had to travel out of troas he decides okay i'm just going to have an all night long sermon i will complete everything that i want to say uh, and then i will move on the next day so his sermon is going on continuously until midnight when uh, this is happening in the upper room he had an audience of believers sitting and listening to him there was a man by the name of eutychus okay and uh, i told us remember people would generally go to work and then they will gather in the evenings um, to listen to god's word and be equipped so it's somewhat like that after a long day of work people were sitting together and this eutychus seems to be tired and he's sinking into a deep sleep okay and uh, the funny thing is when paul is preaching this man was so overcome by sleep that we are told that he fell from the third story and he was taken up dead okay how uh, uh, challenging imagine you know as preachers when we are ministering suddenly you are told that somebody is dead what do you do at that time so paul he quickly goes 
falls on him embraces him and uh, you know he he later on tells the people don't worry his life is in him so it is likely that we already know that he's dead okay he was taken up dead paul goes and ministers to the dead person and he concludes he says don't don't be troubled his life is in him so that means this man was actually resurrected after paul ministered and look at this you know paul he comes back and uh, he continues the service how many preachers do we know like this you know who can uh, quickly go demonstrate god's power come back continue the service as if nothing happened one man actually died in the service okay now uh, people also make jokes out of this and say was paul's preaching so bad that a man slept when he was speaking uh, i don't know i mean i uh, assumption is that this eutychus was very tired after the whole day's work and that is why he um, uh, probably uh, just lost control and those days the setting you know in the upper room maybe there was like an area something like a uh, balcony area where he sat and he lost control and fell from the third story and died but praise god you know paul raised this man from the dead continued the service finished and look at this you know verse 11 it says now when he had come up had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while even till daybreak so paul is continuing after midnight till daybreak to minister to the disciples you know you, you see the passion for the equipping of the saints here and the revelation which god has given you know as i told you earlier he ministered in the school of tyrannus daily for two years how much of content uh, you know you need to minister but god had worked in paul over the years uh, you know he had uh, the word of god in his heart to minister you know, he he was well versed in the scriptures well equipped he is well equipped and he is equipping the believers also in a really good way so he could have just come and said a word of encouragement and gone he could have said okay god bless you be strong but we i we are sure there's much more than that maybe you know he went over the doctrines he went over the mm, the uh, importance of baptism he went over you know the kingdom principles he went over the life of jesus he went about went over you know the power of resurrection so many things he could have talked of because hours together he is ministering okay wow, how beautiful that is the way in which the early church believers were equipped okay we see the ministry of paul in that so after this was done you know this man <laughs> paul goes and he minister still morning time and you also see that the man who fell he was um, brought alive and uh, i don't know whether the man continued to listen to paul speaking or you know he was just asked to rest but you know paul finished what he wanted to say and then he went forward so from tro as he goes to that place called miletus that i showed us on the map so he goes there and there <clears throat> what he does is uh, he invites people from ephesus some of the uh, elders from ephesus okay not everybody from uh, that place but remember the way he exited ephesus was a little um uh, i mean it would have been upsetting for him he has stayed in many cities for a long time but in ephesus he stayed for so long and all this commotion happened about demetrius and he left ephesus maybe you know he left in a in in um, a hurry or he had things to say uh, and uh, he just decided he will say you know when he is on his way back so now he is on his way back and he wants to tell them but also seems like you know um the commotion didn't die down why didn't he go back to ephesus he could have gone there only and spoken to them right but he doesn't do that uh he just stays in miletus and he invites the elders to come because it's kind of close and over here he starts talking to the elders of ephesus you know he talks about his ministry he talks about what he 
he uh, <clears throat> wants them to be careful about okay so this is like a uh, farewell speech you know you, we usually say the most important things to the people that we love we tell them hey take care of so and so you know uh, whatever whatever uh, uh, you have learned the person you have become you know don't lose that continue to be strong we say things like that so this speech that he gives the uh, ephesian elders is somewhat like that and he doesn't go and do this in ephesus but he does it in miletus so he calls for the elders over there uh, they come what are some of the things he says you see he says to uh, i always lived among you and uh, you know from the first day that he says you know from the first day that i came to asia in what manner i always lived lived among you so it also seems like he's giving a clarification because of you know some rumors also that uh, could have been there in ephesus so he's saying but you know my life okay you know me very well uh, and he says i served with all humility with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the jews okay and he says uh i i proclaimed to you, i didn't hold back anything but i taught you i proclaimed to you i did not just teach you publicly but also house to house so you see the kind of ministry that paul had done in the city of ephesus by building up the people and he's saying you people are witnesses okay to what i have done i have uh not withheld any any uh, uh you know anything from you and he says i did not have a bias i i testified to the jews i testified to the greeks okay and uh, now one of the reasons why i am talking to you in this way is was 22 he says i go bound in the spirit to jerusalem not knowing the things that will happen to me there so paul is realizing you know and god would have uh, uh, given him this understanding in his spirit that he is moving closer to his trial and his death and this is an emotional time for paul you know as he's talking to the elders and he's letting them know that he wants them to be strong so he's saying look i go bound in the spirit meaning i am aware that when i go to jerusalem some things are going to happen you know that will put me in chains so he says holy spirit testifies to me that there are chains in every city there are chains and tribulations awaiting me okay but none of these things move me nor i count my life dear to myself so that i may finish my race with joy and the ministry which i received from the lord jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of god so paul is aware of the end of his life and he is also passionate about fulfilling what god has asked him to do you just imagine this i told you his intention is to go towards jerusalem and he is also saying that i am aware if i go there i will encounter uh, difficulty but paul is passionate about finishing you know we talk about fulfilling god's purpose for our lives right sometimes the journey is very very exciting god shows us beforehand i am going to do this this and this which are all amazing things so it's easy as easy for us to move in that direction but god has already given witness to paul's spirit that now onwards you know your journey is going to get you know it was already challenging but it is going to get more challenging to the extent that you know paul this this is very well the end of your life but paul is what is he saying he saying none of these things move me so how should we hold on to uh, god's purpose how should we hold on to uh, god's call it's not just something we do when it is convenient you know if we we are only serving god when it is convenient then it shows a lack of maturity in our lives because uh we we only want you know the easy things but look at paul he saying i know chains 
lie ahead of me in every city there is going to be difficulty for me but i want to finish my race with joy and the ministry which i received from the lord jesus isn't that amazing to have a commitment of that kind and what an example you know when he's talking to the elders he's not just speaking words but he's saying look i have spoken to you through my life you know my life how i served i was i lived in humility in your midst i served so hard right we can see he worked really hard for the people and he also carries passion to complete the work so beautiful example of his own life and uh, the elders would have thought wow you know we want to be like paul we want to serve hard we want to complete finish the race and that is how uh, paul ministered to the ephesian elders in one way you can say that he is also encouraging them because you see it was not a very uh, easy environment the jews were plotting and uh, you know they blamed paul they would have also blamed the elders saying you know the the worship of diana is stopping because of your uh, interference so he is encouraging them and he is uh, giving them that vision for their life and their ministry and let's see what else he says he says uh, that uh, i want you to take care of the church so uh, beautiful verse here mm, yeah verse 28 he says take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the holy spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of god which he purchased with his own blood you know it's like pastor it's like a pastors conference it's like pastors meeting where the senior pastor like paul so far we've seen him as more like an apostle going from you know city to city region to region new churches um, appointing elders and all that but such a pastoral heart he's demonstrating here uh, especially to the ephesian church because he had labored hard for the ephesian church and he's telling look these people who are part of the church you know uh, they they are not just our people but he says the church of god which he purchased with his own blood so he's saying the local church is so precious because what price did god pay for the believers his own blood so it is priceless the value is uh, you know that you you can't put a uh, a number to it because god has purchased with his own blood and he says he has appointed you he has made you overseers elders okay so you please take it seriously you be responsible about it and you know be responsible for the church so he is giving them a lesson on how to do ministry you do ministry be an example like paul how he served how he's holding on to his ministry passionately he said nothing will shake me right and now in addition to that he's saying the value which is placed on god's people you need to value them and like a shepherd he says uh, uh, you are the shepherds holy spirit has made you overseers to do what to shepherd the church or in other words simple words take care take care of god's people how to take care of god's people teach them the word how did paul take care of uh, the the ephesian church he, daily he was imparting into them right so the ministry of the word the ministry of the spirit we are responsible we have to equip the people so equip them and also he adds other things he says that you know uh, there will be people uh, uh, who who may rise up from among you who will who will teach wrong things you know speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves so there can be people who rise up who will try to uh, uh you know distract the believers so one thing is you teach them okay one thing is you equip them you help them to mature another thing is protect them because there can be people who will bring in wrong teaching 
they will uh, in fact verse 29 he says savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock so what is the responsibility of the elders of a church equip them protect them protect them from what from false teachers from false uh, prophets from false teachings okay when we study about the antichrist and you know in the last days many will go away from the faith why because one of the things is sorry there will be strange teachings so he wants to warn the elders and say it is your responsibility you have to protect the sheep from all the false teachings and you know the people who are he calls them savage wolves and he says will come in they will come in among you they will uh, you know they could also have risen from you right uh, but ultimately what is the point as a shepherd guide protect the people so that they continue in the faith and they remain in the faith so in this way he encourages them and then he says verse 31 he says therefore watch and remember that for 3 years so totaling up you know his time in the synagogue his time in the school of terinus and all the other activities over there he says 3 years i did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears so he has equipped the church very very well so uh, and then you know he uh, gives them a uh, an encouragement again so he tells them to take care of the church and now he says that uh, i i want you to dedicate yourself to the word of god verse 32 you know he says the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified so look at that as he is leaving he knows he will never come back to ephesus again he will never see these people again because once he goes to jerusalem he is going closer to his death and he is saying you know when 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 we are almost at the end we want to give people that one key isn't it that unlocks uh, the treasure for them so you could say that verse 32 is like that one key he says i commend you to god and to the word of his grace so be close to god or maintain your communion with god and maintain your communion in the word because he says it is the word of god which is able to build you up it is the word of god which is able to give those uh, spiritual dividends no spiritual inheritance that uh, is there for all the saints the sanctified people of god so he emphasizes along with doing ministry you know along with taking care of god's people personally you know each one of you you be strong in god you be strong in his word and the word will strengthen you even more it will build you up and it will give you an inheritance so he gives them that key that this is how you can be strong in god and then you know he also makes a clarification he says look i did not covet anyone's silver or gold or apparel now there were so many things being said about paul isn't it because demetrius was making such a big um uh, claim about paul that he has turned people away and all and maybe people were also saying that uh, maybe paul wanted the money right but paul is clarifying see you always clarify to your small group if people outside don't believe us sometimes it's easy to handle that but when people in our close circle they don't believe us it's very hard so he is just making a clarification to these people and he's saying look you know i i have not it's not for money that i came right to all of you because if that is what paul wanted he would have lived and done his ministry very differently but he is clarifying and he's saying that um, you know uh, you know that these hands have provided for my necessities so he he was a tent maker remember in corinth also he joined along with aquila and priscilla so looks like in ephesus also he labored he labored okay and he labored in such a way he's saying that uh, um i lay 
verse 35 i have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the lord jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive now for a minister of god you know we see paul uh, talk about how you know supporting somebody who is in the ministry is a good thing it's a good thing but you see his example over here in ephesus he worked hard he even provided for himself maybe through his trade so that he does not put a burden on the believers okay now that attitude is very important you know not that uh, ministers of god should not uh, receive a support yeah they also deserve a support but paul he knew uh, or, or or basically you discern where you are and you know what the situation is what the circumstances everywhere we go if we demand and say hey i i am doing ministry and uh, this is uh, this is how much money i should get no this is the kind of clothes i will wear this is the kind of place i will stay in i need all these all these privileges and uh, uh, you know i want this kind of a setup then only do the ministry what happens you know in some places maybe the believers are able to support Uh, their their pastor or their leader they are able to give but in some places maybe the believers are very poor and they can't give now if we make a demand and say i am serving you in the word of god you have to take care of me like this only that would not be uh, uh, that would not fall in line with the example of paul okay so paul is accommodating depending on the play places the regions he understands and he says look in ephesus what did i do i worked hard with these hands are provided for me so uh he did not want to become a burden as a minister so wherever possible you know he worked he uh, supported himself and he took care of himself and he talks about how it is more blessed to give than to receive so we can learn so much about ministry from uh, paul and the way he is talking to the ephesian leaders you know just encouraging their hearts and at the same time uh, guiding them on how they can fulfill their ministry for the lord okay now after he had said all these things you see uh, uh, he knelt down and prayed with them all what a beautiful bond you know it's it's not like you know how we see the the corporate world where uh, okay this is the task you do the task i will tell you what to do that's it it's not like that you know church is not like that the, the team of elders uh, at, at least in the case of the efficient elders it seems like paul had a, uh, a a nice connection with them that human connection over the last 3 years he had ministered to them they had seen his life he had uh, understood them and so you know he's what is he doing it's like brothers you know they are praying together they are praying they knelt down and they all prayed together and then uh, we are also told that they all wept freely and fell on paul's neck and kissed him so it shows affection Okay. so the uh, the ministry work or the ministry team it's not just a very army like setup but there is that affection you know particularly in this team where they are even shedding tears because they have understood why is paul talking to us like this why is he uh, you know giving us advice like this he's not going to come back this is the last time that we are seeing him in the natural so you know they are crying uh, and and they even hug him you know that that was their way of uh, fell on paul's neck and kissed him. that was their way of expressing the love and affection brotherly love so they did that and then uh, paul many other things he would have spoken to them but luke has recorded you know a couple of things for us here to understand uh, what was the priority in paul's heart uh, and then we are told that uh, so sorry most of all for the words which he spoke he he must have ministered to them in many things and the people also they they were uh, sad and they were uh, just uh, having that time of fellowship with paul okay in those in those moments 
and finally they accompanied him to the ship because paul has a journey to make he has to continue uh, and uh, he has to complete the journey that god has set before him so he moves on from there so we've seen in miletus they had that small elders meeting and now paul is moving on from there okay what happens next you know uh, he comes uh, to a place called cause and uh, the following day to Rhodes and from there to Patara. I'm just telling you the names of places. So he moved in this way and finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia. And then uh, when he sighted Cyprus, uh, sailed to Syria and landed at a place called Tyre. Okay, he landed at a place called Tyre. Now, in Tyre, when he comes there, uh, the ship had to unload her cargo but even in that place okay now paul did not obviously when we read the passage here it doesn't say that he had an intention to get down in tyre and uh, you know uh, do some ministry there and all the ship happened to stop there to unload some cargo but even there you know he found some disciples and stayed with them seven days that is so beautiful that tells us that over these years you know as paul has been making the missionary journeys people are hearing the gospel it's not paul going to every city but you know the disciples would have gone the believers would have gone they would have preached the gospel so in a place called tyre he is finding disciples now how exciting has it happened to you you just go somewhere it's an unknown place but you meet a believer there and you're thinking, hey, how did how do you know about Jesus? Somebody must have preached to them. You know? And then you start talking and you find out, hey, they also have very good churches. Wow. How did they plant churches here? And it's really refreshing and strengthening. So you find that he found some disciples in Tyre. Okay. Uh, and uh, he's he and those days they had this culture of hospitality. So they would just let you stay in their home. So seven days. He stayed there and no, look at this in verse 4. These disciples, they are telling Paul by the spirit, they're telling him don't go to Jerusalem. So, you know, it always does not take a mighty prophet to come and tell us the word of God. You know, thus says the Lord. The disciples are telling him, you know, it's like a confirmation. He already told the elders at Ephesus that, if I go to Jerusalem, I'm in trouble. The disciples here, they are telling Paul by the spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Okay. So look at this. They understood that there is trouble in Jerusalem. But, you know, this is like interpreting the prophecy partly right. Paul knew that there is trouble in Jerusalem, but he's still going to Jerusalem. He said that none of these things shake me. These people, they knew that there is trouble in Jerusalem, but it's like they have added their concern and they're telling him, don't go. Okay. But obviously, you know, Paul was uh, so strong in the Lord and he had that discernment not to follow their instruction. Uh, well and good. That the spirit of god has revealed something to them but how to act on that word paul knew that it's not about saving my life you know i have to go to jerusalem that is part of god's purpose for my life so the well-meaning believers they're telling him don't go but paul still has to go and he does go uh, but the beautiful thing is you know god is revealing such a uh, you know su such an important thing that is going to happen to him through some normal disciples that he found in tyre okay so they're telling him don't go uh, but uh, after that he sorry he moves on from there after praying with them and all that, you know, usual uh, nice things. So he moves on from there. And then he comes to uh, a place called Caesarea. Okay? And in Caesarea, uh, someone familiar lived there. Who is this? Philip the Evangelist. 
You know, for the first time, Philip is called as the evangelist here. Earlier in Acts 8, we saw him doing so much ministry work. Before that, he was selected as a volunteer in the church. But you don't read too much, you know, about what is his title, what is his position. For the first time, you read about the title or the position in the kingdom of God. You know, some a beautiful lesson we can learn is, you know, we should just serve. Don't worry, you know, about am I uh, evangelist, am I pastor, am I anointed prophet? Not necessary. Look at uh, Philip. Faithfully, he does the ministry. Luke never points out to say that he is, uh, you know, evangelist or something like that. But finally, only now, Acts 21, there is a title attached to his name. And it's a title for service. So we should not become too attached to the titles, but just do God's work. However he calls you, just, you know, serve. So Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven. And again, you know, these people in Caesarea, they are hospitable. They open up their home. Uh, and Philip is, you know, a known person also. Sorry. Um, so uh, he stays there. And Philip had four virgin daughters. So you could say young girls, young girls, uh, and they prophesied. Okay. So uh, again, it's beautiful that, that you find that the, the gifts of the spirit, remember in Acts, uh, we, we know that God will pour out his spirit on all flesh, sons and daughters, right? They'll uh, move in the gifts of the spirit. So here you have women, four daughters, all four of them, prophesied. So the evangelist, his daughters are prophesying. And when they stayed there, uh, a, a prophet named Agabus, remember Agabus is the one who came to Antioch also. He's a prominent uh, prophet and he was the one who prophesied about the famine, uh, which, which will affect Jerusalem. Uh, but now uh, he comes and he prophesies. Okay, he prophesies over Paul. In verse 11, he says, he took Paul's belt. He bound his own hands and feet and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So once again, you see confirmation after confirmation. He himself knows that he will be bound in Jerusalem. The disciples in Tyre told him, don't go there. There is trouble for you. Now, Agabus the prophet, he's doing a prophetic act. You know, sometimes you can uh, show what you are understanding through an action. So he's binding himself with Paul's belt and he's saying, this belt, you know, who, to whomever this belt belongs to, that person is going to be bound. So, yeah, it, it is, uh, it is quite challenging, but God is confirming. Uh, and when... Uh, they heard these things, you know, uh, people, the people there, you know, they pleaded with Je with Paul and they said, don't go, please don't go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, okay, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm not ready only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So, uh, uh, you know, basically the people finally saw his commitment and they said the will of the lord be done so you see the the personality the life the commitment of apostle paul so committed he knows what is going to happen and he's saying i know you're all well meaning in fact over here they all cried they wept and they said paul don't go they're going to catch you but he's saying look i'm not just ready to be caught i'm even ready to die Okay, what amazing passion and commitment one can have for the ministry and for the gospel. With this, let's stop. Uh, I'll continue uh, from here when we uh, come back for the next class. And also I'll post your assignment by tonight so you know what you need to do. Uh, and we can complete uh, this course you know, uh, comfortably. So let's just pray and close. Uh, I want to request, Arun, could you just pray? Sure, Pastor. Yeah. We pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. And Lord, thank you for um, letting us dive in in the life of Paul missionary journey. Lord, as we, Lord, as um, um, Paul was zealous for you, 
and he was mightily used by you, O oh Lord. Oh, Father, we believe and know that you will use us same. Uh, because in your word says you are the same God that stated you forever and you will always be the same. So Lord, let, let, let the flame of serving heart keep burning in our life, Lord Father, uh, till, till we finish our race in you. So Lord Father, let your peace and favor be upon each and every one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Uh, yeah, continue to have a blessed time as you attend other classes. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.